Uh, friends, uh, if you have your scripture with you, please turn with me uh, to Book of Judges, chapter 19, verses 1 to 15. And we will be concluding uh, our sermon series in the Judges today. So chapter 19, reading from verse 1. In those days, Israel had no king. Now Levite, who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim, took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But she was unfaithful to him. She left him and went back to her father's house in Bethlehem, Judah. After she had been there four months, her husband went to her to persuade her to return. Uh, he had with him his servant and two donkeys. She took him uh, into her father's house. And when her father saw him, uh, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, prevailed upon him to stay. So he remained with him three days, eating and drinking and sleeping there. On the fourth day, they got up early and he prepared to leave. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, refresh yourself with something to eat. Then you can go. So the two of them sat down to eat and drink together. Afterward, the girl's father said, Please stay tonight and enjoy yourself. And when the man got up to go, his father-in-law persuaded him, so he stayed there that night. On the morning of the fifth day, when he rose to go, the girl's father said, Refresh yourself. Wait till afternoon. So the two of them ate together. Then when the man with his concubine and his servant got up to leave, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said, Now look, it's almost evening. Spend the night here. The day is nearly over. Stay and enjoy yourself. Early tomorrow morning, you can get up and be on your way home. But unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went toward Jebus, uh, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. When they were near Jebus and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, Come, let's stop at the city of the Jebusites and spend the night. His master replied, No, we won't go into an alien city whose people are not Israelites. We will go on to Gibeah. He added, come, let's try to reach Gibeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on, and the sun set as they neared Gibeah and Benjamin. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them into his home for the night. Uh, this is God's word for us uh, this morning. Friends, uh, shall we pray together as we continue to hear for God's word uh, this morning? God of hope, amid all the concerns in the world around us, we turn to your word. Send your Holy Spirit to still our thoughts and speak your wisdom to us. Fill us with the humble confidence we meet in Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Well, friends, uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, it feels like maybe people are kind of getting comfortable from the pandemic now, and I'm starting to see more people uh, coming back to church. It's just good to see you in person. And uh, we do also have some uh, visitors uh, that are here with us, and some of them have come for the first time today. Uh, some of them have been here for a few weeks and a few months. And so if you haven't had the chance to say hello, uh, please, uh, say hello to one another and welcome each other and uh, make them feel at home. And I hope uh, all of you will be blessed by one another. And so may you be an encouragement and uh, may you also be encouraged as well as we continue to fellowship uh, in Christ. And I believe there are refreshments following the service and so you'll have ample opportunity to do that. Um, any handyman out here, out there today? Or a handy woman? Any of you like to work with, uh, you know, uh, wood and so forth, tools and all of that? Uh, any of you like to work with tools but not very good at it? <laughs> okay. Well, so you, you're going to get some remedial stuff uh, here today. You know, this is one of those things, right? It's a very handy tool, isn't it? You know, if you want to make sure things are like 90 degrees and straight, 
you know, when you put a wood, you could put it there and, and uh, make sure that it's nine degrees and you could hammer or screw it in or nail or what have you and, uh, you know, get the job done. But, you know, it's great. This is 45 degree angle. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with it. apparently this thing. If you know what you're doing, there's a bunch of things that you can do with it. But, you know, whenever uh, you're building, you just want to make sure everything's straight, right? And so it's got these little edges here. And if you're cutting a two by four and you want to cut it in half, you could put it there. And there's actually like, you know, dent at one inch, one and a half, two, and so forth. You could put a pencil and just ride along and then draw a straight line. Did you know you could do that with this? Man, you're getting a lot of uh, free tips here today at, uh, at church, right? And, uh, and so, you know, you, you can do that. And why do people use tools like this? Hmm? I mean, we have eyes. What's more accurate, this tool or your eyes? The tool. How often we think, oh, you know, I'll just, I'll just eyeball it. <laughs> and whenever you eyeball it, <laughs> there's something that always follows after. It's called regret, <laughs> right? Uh, so I think I'm not much of a handyman, but they always say measure twice, cut once. Okay, you don't want to do it the other way, right? If you measure once and cut twice, it means something went wrong and lumber prices are pretty expensive these days. So you just want to make sure you measure twice and cut only once. But you know, we laugh at it, but whenever we eyeball it, we make mistakes. When we eyeball it, we make mistakes. How often when we are younger, and maybe even now, thought that we were right, but only to discover that we were wrong. And I suppose the wisdom of life is that we don't always learn wisdom because we were always right. In many cases, we were wrong so many times <laughs> We know now that we were wrong. Uh, and, and so we learn to be humble because uh, it might be possible I'm wrong now. And, and so whenever we get our own way and do whatever we want to do, it may not always be the best course for our lives. In the book of Judges, we hear that phrase quite often, in those days, Israel had no king. And, and that's how also the book of Judges end. In those days, Israel had no king. And everybody did whatever they wanted to do. I'll eyeball it. I'll just eyeball it. Even in construction, when you're just eyeballing it, you can be wrong. You can be dead wrong. And it could be a very costly expense. And today, we're seeing in the history of the Israelites, and I've heard some people say, I wish I could get rid of that book, uh, the book of Judges, because God's people don't look very good in that book. They said, you know, it's just depressing, because uh, this is not uh, about the, you know, it's not the, the, you know, Ammonites or, you know, all the Philistines that we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the Israelites. They are supposed to be the people of God. But by the time we get to the end of the book of Judges, they're no different than the very people that God was punishing because they were full of sin. In the previous chapters, we hear of Israelites making idols and worshiping it. There's one leader who even sacrifices daughter to God. And these are the kind of things that God just detested. The people in this land that God's given to his people, before they came, they were actually sacrificing their sons and daughter to a fire god named Moloch. Think about that. How can you sacrifice your own child to an idol? I mean, what kind of god is this? I don't know about you, that's not the kind of God I want to worship. 
That's not the kind of God I want to spend eternity with. But the Israelites had become just like the people they were supposed to be different from. You know, we never want the people of God to be so heaven-bound we're earthly no good. But just like Jesus, he wants us to know that we're not of this world. But he has left us in this world to do God's work. So while we're here, this is not our permanent home. We were sent here like as ambassadors to represent God as the children of the king. As daughters and sons of the living God, the almighty God, we are here to represent him. But we're not of this world. This is not our final destination. In those days, Israel had no king. People did whatever they wanted to do. Is that true? They did have a king. It's just that they chose to ignore him. They just were indifferent. Because in their limited thinking and immature thinking that if there is no king, well then I could do whatever I want to. It's like if there's no mom, I could have ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If dad's not around, you know, I could just do whatever I want, go for a joyride in his car, even when he's only 15. To do whatever you want to do, it might seem like a good idea initially, but it's not a good idea when you find out it's not a good idea. And we've all been there, haven't we? And today, we hear of a story and the, all the characters are not named. And I wonder why that is. It's just a Levite. It's just a woman, a concubine, a father-in-law. No names are given. Is it because they're not worthwhile naming? Or are they just generic because it represents all of us, all humanity? I leave that for you uh, to decide. Maybe it's a little bit of both. But we're told a Levite who was living in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine. That should be a warning already, shouldn't it? By the way, as your pastor, I just have one wife. Uh, uh, And I, I plan to stay that way. I know we're living in some strange times, but... What if a minister took another wife? His Florida wife and Toronto wife. Uh, that probably won't go too well, will it? I don't think so, not at least in our Presbyterian circles. But that's what this Levite was doing. He took another wife. And this kind of mentioned it so casually. Yeah, took another concubine. As if there's nothing wrong with it. Because apparently in those days, Israel had no king. They did whatever they wanted to do. And he gets this young concubine from Bethlehem and Judah. But we're told she was unfaithful to him. So already, a Levite taking a wife, unimaginable. A now wife is also being unfaithful to her husband, having an affair unthinkable. And not only that, she decides to leave and goes back to her father's house. And so this Levi lets around four months pass by and says, yeah, I kind of miss her. I think I'm going to go get, go back and, you know, go fetch her. Uh, it's kind of his idea. And he goes, and when he comes, the father-in-law is so happy because back in those days for a woman to get married and to come back to, you know, father's home, that was a disgrace. And so the father-in-law is so happy to see him, and he's practicing hospitality uh, like good you know, people in the Holy Land did back in those days. 
and he's extended hospitality for one day, two days, three days, and he's urging him to keep staying even more and more. Uh, and after you know, five days of this, the man decides to leave. Uh, and during this time, we don't see the husband dining with the wife or anything like that per se. It's just he went and sweet talked her into coming. And so is she coming out of her own volition or is she coming because her father is sending her? Not sure. It's not quite clear. Uh, so when she left, she must have left for a reason. Uh, and now she's leaving. Uh, and maybe she, it's her father making her. Or maybe she's just going to say, well, give it another try. And, and so they're on this journey. And um, they come to, uh, to Jebus and they say, no, no, let's not stay there because they're not Israelites. And so because they're foreigners, he thinks that maybe they might be ill-treated. And because of this, they go and they travel a little bit farther. Uh, and then they say, let's go to Gibeah or Ramah, because that's where the Israelites are. And back in those days, they, they didn't have, you know, Howard Johnson or these motels that you know, will leave the light on for you. They didn't have motels and hotels like that. And, and so to practice hospitality was one of those things that, you know, something that they were supposed to do. And, and so when you go to the gate of a city, the people in there would come and they would exercise hospitality by taking you in. And when you travel, you would expect that, you know, your fellow countrymen and women also do the same for you. But nobody would take them in. And finally, this old man uh, comes in. And, and if you read the uh, the scripture very carefully here, it's very reminiscent of almost Lot, right, in Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, where this man actually is not from this place. He's, a, he, you know, he's actually from the same place where the Levite was from. He invites him to come to his house, and the Levite says, hey, I don't want to be in any trouble. I got all my supplies. All I just need is a place to stay. I have food for me, you know, my servant, my, you know, uh, the, your maidservant. Uh, and, and, and for the animals, we don't need anything. And the man said, no, just come, just come. And he's exercising this uh, hospitality. And then something terrible happens. I remember as a teenager, when I read these narratives for the first time, I could not believe my eyes. I could not believe my ears. And um, these three chapters, I do encourage, if you want to know more deeper, read it. Uh, at home. But as you know, that the men of the town found out about these men who were staying at this old man's house. And a mob had come and said, bring that man out so we can have relations with him. Same thing happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's happening here. And the old man, just like in Sodom and Gomorrah, says, look, I have a daughter who's not known a man before. Why don't you take her and do whatever you want to do? Remember Lot saying those kind of words? In those days, Israelites had no king and people did whatever they wanted to do. By the way, this is descriptive, not prescriptive, because everything is in the scripture. It doesn't mean it's telling you to do that. This is descriptive of what's happened. Something terrible's happened. Israel is in a place right now, they're so crooked and wicked. They're no different from anybody else that's there. The depravity of humanity has now reached its peak, just like the Israelites. Just like to the Israelites, just like to the wicked people who were there before. But in their eyes, they don't think anything is wrong. You know, whenever you put a painting up on, you know, the wall of your house, how do you go about doing it? You know, you put a screw on and then, you know, maybe there's a little wire that, you know, uh, that's at the back of the painting and you hook it and, you know, one person goes to the front and the husband or wife or whoever is at the back and you say, hey, can you look? And then you, 
kind of do this a little bit. It just straightens ah, a little to the left. Ah, you do this ah, a little to the right. Ah, just a tiny bit to the left. And, you know, you do this and you straighten out the painting, right? And you come back and like, yeah, that looks about straight. Is it straight? Maybe. <laughs> but if you want to know if it's really straight, what do you do? You get a leveler. <laughs> Right? And if you put it on top of the painting and that little, uh, you know, bubble in that thing goes right in the middle, you know that your painting is straight. You might think it's straight, but it might not be. But once you put that measure there, you know that the painting is straight. Obviously, the people in Gibeah to go to someone's house and to demand a person to come out so that they can have relations with them. They thought, in their eyes, this is just perfectly fine. How depraved do you need to be to start thinking that sin is okay? The Israelites have become so comfortable in their surrounding that they don't know from right and left anymore, from right and wrong, they just don't know. And nobody is bringing out straight edges or levelers to make sure and to see and measure if they're in the right or wrong. Because in those days, they had no kin. And they did whatever they wanted to do. If a Levite, a leader is doing it, You don't need to ask what the rest of the population is doing. If a leader and a teacher to the people who are supposed to be teaching them the things of God, if his life is so crooked, how is he supposed to teach other people to be straight? And they're just spiraling. So God had placed Israel in this promised land to conquest Right? He wanted to root out the evil in the land and establish in it his righteousness. But that conquest soon turns into compromise. And when that compromise starts to happen, chaos and confusion sets in. And now, another C word, calamity strikes. They abuse this Levite's concubine all night long. Uh, They didn't throw the daughter out, but they actually gave the concubine to the people, and they did whatever they did to her. And you know, in the morning, uh, just as it's dawning, she came to the door, and she was at the door, and she collapsed. This Levite, when he gets up later in the morning, he goes to the door and says, get up, let's go home. No more that sweet talking that he did to persuade her to come with him. But now, get up, let's go. I don't know how you can sleep while someone that you love or you say that you love is being tortured the way she is. Is that the first word that a Levite should say to his wife? Get up, let's go home. Is that the word to say? Are you all right? Are you okay? I mean, she should have never been thrown out in the first place to the the mom. And surely the first words he's speaking should not be those things. But you know, he takes her home. And he puts her on the donkey and takes her home. And the scripture is kind of ambiguous as to if she's already dead or not. But when, she goes, when they go home, he actually divides her body into 12 and sends it uh, to the 12 tribes of Israel. And as a result, a nation gathers together. And the 11 tribes go assembled in great large number, 400,000 fighting men. And they go uh, to the tribe of Benjamin. And they go to Gibeah and ask the leaders to hand those people over. But for some reason, the Benjaminites, they will not turn them over. So as a result, they go to war. 
and both sides actually suffer large casualties. Do you know that in the book of Judges is the first time the nation gathers together? The first time that they've gathered together as a nation to fight, but they're not fighting the enemy outside. They're fighting with each other. It's such a sobering, shocking story. And I'm wondering, should I preach this on a Sunday? It's in the scripture. I suppose what God wasn't shy to live out, leave in there, maybe I shouldn't be shy to preach it on Sunday. But isn't it true, though, Often as people of God, do you get hurt by the people outside or do you often get hurt by the people inside? Think about that. It has been also my experience I've often observed people in the church attacking one another. They assemble and gather a lot of energy tearing one another apart instead of building up one another. So maybe the Israelites' history, the shameful history, is not so foreign after all. Because even if we belong to God, there are a lot of times we act as if he's not there. And we do whatever we want to do, whatever is right in our eyes. Conquest has become a compromise. That compromise has turned into confusion and chaos, and now calamity has struck. And there was always many chances to do a U-turn. It's like the GPS saying U-turn. Do a U-turn at your nearest turn, but they keep going because they think that they're right. Because I know I'm right. But in the end, they're so dead wrong. You know, this Levite was in a rush to tell the rest of the people how much he's been wronged. But is he the only one who's been wronged? Or is he actually wrong? (laughs) He's been wrong, but he's also wrong himself. There's nobody righteous in the story. And I think that's why perhaps both sides suffer casualties because God is saying, look, you guys are coming, right, coming against the tribe of Benjamin because of the wrong that they did, but you're not innocent yourselves. And every time they suffer loss from all the way from Egypt to the promised land, it was always suffering loss as a punishment for their sins. God is no respecter of men and women. He treats the people of both camps equally. God doesn't say when we sin as his people, ah, that's okay. It's just my kids doing it. God's not like that. He doesn't play favoritism. Sin is sin. Sin and the penalty and the way it's destructive to our lives and to community of God. God detests it. So the Levite is wrong. The concubine is wrong. The mob is wrong. The whole Israelites, they are in calamity and shambles. Last prop. I heard men usually like this stuff. You know what this is? No, it's just a string, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, it, it is a, uh, just a very roof rough uh, plumb line. You know, when you're uh, building frame downstairs and something that's a little bit longer, sometimes this just doesn't cut it. It might be straight at the beginning over here, but when you're dealing with things that are on a long-term basis, it's like when you're five, you thought you were right about something, 
But when you became a teenager, you say, oh, why did I think like that when I was five? And when you become 19, you look at yourself back at when you're 13 and you say, I wore that when I was 13? I liked that boy when I was 13. What was I thinking? And then we get older and plumb line is great if you're building something really tall. And so if you're doing a framework, you put, you know, frame on the ceiling perhaps and, you know, maybe you put a, you know, two by four, a beam over here, and it's kind of, you know, it's coming down, and at the bottom, you're not sure if it's straight or not. So one of the ways you can do it is where it's attached, you go about two inches and drill a nail in there, hang this thing, and where that, you know, thing meets the bottom, you go another two inch where this hits, and then you know that it's completely straight, right? Is that right? Does that sound right? Yeah? So that's how plumb line works. And so, you know, more or less, and so that's kind of the principle behind it. You know, it's only God who has that kind of wisdom and that long-term perspective and is able to guide us and all people at all times. This is a very divided nation right now because they have no reference point. And if everybody did whatever they want to do, it's just preference versus someone else's preference. And everybody has different preferences. So how does anything ever get done? But to have a king who is all wise and all knowing, it's a wonderful thing. So friends, here are the words that God gave to Joshua, when he went into that promised land, he said, Joshua, be strong, be courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. God has not given up his promise or his dreams. He's always truthful to his covenant. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. So the, the proximity in which Joshua walks with God's word is going to be determinant of the success he's going to have. He says, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. What is the secret to success of your life and the success of the communion that we have as a people of God and to have a flourishing community? It's God's words. God's will. God's plumb line, right? God's measure. God's standard. God's perfect rule. So God says, blessed is the man in Psalms, Psalm 1, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand away of the sinners of the seat of mockers. So people who do not compromise with the world and its wickedness, but instead they delight in the law of the Lord and on his law, his words, they meditate day and night like a tree planted by streams of water which yields, fruit and, yields its fruit in season. Friends, the union that we have and the communion that we'll celebrate, it's not in my preference or your preference, but it's in a king that we do have. The communion that we have for people who are broken and often faulty, and whose eyeballing is not that good. God sends a king, a perfect king, a servant king, a savior king that we all need. Because all of us have sinned. The Levite, the concubine, the 11 tribes, the Benjaminites. They've all sinned do have a merciful Savior King. And it's in his forgiveness. It's in his truth that we have 
communion. Friends, uh, we will together now celebrate uh, the Lord's uh, table. Uh, if you can, Ben, if you can also get the PowerPoints uh, ready, there'll be portions where we will be uh, reading and praying together in as a response. And if you can have your elements ready, that'll be great as well. Brothers and sisters, this is a joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is a table not of one denomination, but of our one Lord Jesus Christ. It is made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often, and you who have not been for a long time. Our Savior invites all those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. Friends, around this table, we celebrate God's generosity to us in Christ and in creation. And so at this time, we also present our offerings in gratitude for all God has given to us. Let us pray. God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gifts. Our gifts may not be perfect, but bless them with your Holy Spirit to spread your goodness in the world for the sake of Christ, our living Lord. Amen. Jesus invites us to this table, and now we do as Jesus did. We take this bread and this wine, ordinary things of the world, in these, Jesus has promised to be present. Through these, Christ can make us whole. So come, all of you. This is a joyful feast of the people of God. As Jesus offered thanks for the gifts of the earth, let us also bless God with great thanksgiving. Friends, let's respond to this prayer together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, Holy One, Holy Three, you are source of all that exists. You are beyond the galaxies, deeper than the oceans. You pour down rain and bring forth the fruit of the earth. You carry us through deep waters and hold us in the darkest night. So with you, so with all your creatures, great and small, with angels and archangels, with saints and servants in every generation, we join in the rejoicing of your creation. Your part. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy is your son Jesus, O God, walking this earth, feeding the hungry, calling the lost, noticing the forgotten, healing those who reached out, teaching those who sought wisdom. He revealed your kingdom in our midst. Today we thank you for all Jesus shared with us to show us that you are always with us and times of plenty and times of pain. And so we celebrate the mystery of our faith in him. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will rise again. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, when the sounds of your rejoicing fall silent, we remember those who cannot rejoice today. We face times of pain or fear or upheaval. We think especially of those who Countries have been overwhelmed by earthquakes, flood, storms, and hurricanes, by conflicts, drought, or famine. And in the hour of the silence, Lord, we lift them up to you.
Lord, draw near to them in the power of your spirit to strengthen and sustain them through Christ's compassionate, compassion in ours. Holy Spirit, come now and settle on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. May they become for us Christ's body and lifeblood healing, uh, forgiving and making us whole. So may we become Christ's body, the church, loving and caring throughout the whole world until that day when all creation feasts with you in the fullness of your mercy and peace that we savor today in the name of our Lord who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you, and this cup is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us take. Body of Christ. Blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray together. Loving God, Christ our Lord, Holy Spirit, you have nourished us, body and soul, in this meal. We have heard your love, so send us out to speak it. We have seen your love, so send us out to show it. We have been fed by your love, so send us out to share it. And let all these things be done for your glory. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.